Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I remember waking up. I can move, but I don't. I can hear something rustling in the carpet near me. You know how quiet it can get and you can hear everything. It becomes apparent that something is in the room with us. I try laying still. At this point, I'm terrified. But my fear is cranked up when I feel little tickles on my bare back, as though a dog were smelling me and lightly brushing its whiskers on me. It's doing something to my back. I remember my mother beside me breathe a heavy sigh. This gives me the courage to get up. I do so, and in the dark I head for the light switch. Before I reach it, I see something run across the floor. I could only see its shape in the darkness. It was maybe a foot tall or less. This made me stop, but in less than a second, it was gone. I turn the light on, and there's nothing. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A woman begins receiving strange text messages shortly after her husband dies. Could they actually be from him? The Coast Guard sees something completely unexpected when on the lookout for seafaring drug smugglers. A group of friends see a shadow in the backyard, but there is no one there to cast that shadow. Could a young, sick little girl's birth defect actually have been caused by a dark, supernatural entity? Judging a stranger's appearance creates torment for the rest of a girl's life. Footsteps in the dark, things moved without explanation, pets acting strange, and now it's invading her dreams and nightmares. It's all happening to one girl, and it won't stop. Black-eyed kid encounters typically happen with the child trying to gain entry into the home and begging for you to let them in. But what happens if you discover there is already a black-eyed child in your home? A family experiences scary creatures in the dark and strange lights in the sky. A series of strange and terrifying events haunt a family over several years. On March 9, 1929, the perfect murder occurred in New York City. To this day, it has never been solved despite literally dozens of theories, not about the identity of the killer, but as to how the victim was actually killed. Is it possible our whole world and our universe might be a virtual reality matrix, programmed by the supercomputer of a civilization of beings more advanced than we could possibly imagine? A colorful clown knick-knack terrorizes a young girl, one of the most bizarre incidents in the history of L.A. law enforcement uncovers a link to one of the most heinous crimes in history. Plus, a few other short true stories. The Cursed Skull. These shoes were made for walking. Divorce precognition. Boy in a sailor suit. A demon of a party. And window watcher. Now, bolt your doors. Lock your windows turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. This has been going on a long time, and I've been trying to find help, but no one believes me. I need to preface this by saying I'm a writer, so just because it might not look written by a scared teenager, that's why. 
But also, I'm not a very good writer, so if it doesn't seem professional, that's why. Anyway, my house has been the home of a spirit of some sort for as long as I can remember. Now, I know what you're thinking, and no, this isn't the normal I noticed a ghost in my house but that's it kind of thing. This is whatever is in here hates me kind of thing. I'm not sure how to start this all, so I guess I'll state some facts. Number one, this is all true. Number two, whatever this thing is scares me. Number three, it won't stop. And number four, I need someone to believe me. Like I said, this has been happening for as long as I can remember. The first time I noticed anything, I was alone at home. Now, when I say at home alone, I mean I was now old enough to be at home alone. I was very little and very afraid. I remember sitting on my parents' bed watching TV and hearing footsteps outside the door. I hadn't heard any cars pull in, so I looked out the window and saw that I was right. I've always had pets, but it was definitely human footsteps that I was hearing. Footsteps are the common thing to happen, along with things getting moved, pets acting strange, and more recently, it's been invading my dreams and nightmares. Now, I know I'm more sensitive to this stuff than my family is, but when I bring any of this up, they act like I'm crazy or making it up. And trust me, I wish I was making this up. After the incident with the footsteps, it became a normal thing for me. But then my cat started acting odd, especially when he was in my room. I remember one night I was trying to fall asleep, and my cat sleeps in my room, so he was on my bed with me. Then he starts staring at something, which is weird, but whatever, he's an old cat. But he stands up and starts meowing without looking away from the random spot on the opposite wall, which kind of freaked me out, not gonna lie. But then he starts running around my room and acting crazy and making tons of noise. Then he bolts out of my room. He didn't come back to sleep in my room for a week. Things like this have been happening all around my house for years, but more recently it seems more directed at me. A few months ago, a friend of mine had the idea to do a small cleansing of the house. We were at my house alone and decided that was the best time to do it. We blessed some water and put mint in it. We walked all over the house, flicked it in the corners, and we said a prayer as we went. And for a couple hours, it seemed lighter and the air felt clearer. But then things got worse. After that, I was home alone. At the time, I worked 12-hour shifts in a warehouse. I liked taking baths to relieve muscle pain. I was in the bathtub, and I had a bottle of sage essential oil. I loved putting it in the water. It helped me relax. Well, I'd been completely still for about five minutes, and all of a sudden, the bottle got roughly knocked over. That freaked me out, but things like that had been happening for years. After a couple more minutes, I got sleepy out of nowhere. I closed my eyes, but I didn't think I was actually falling asleep. It's all a bit fuzzy and muddled, but I remember standing in another room of my house. But I didn't remember getting out of the tub. But then I woke up in the bathtub. This happened quite a few times, and every time I'd be in a different part of my house, and I wasn't alone someone would always be standing next to me, but I never looked up. I was always staring at my feet and could only see an arm or a hand. But then I would suddenly wake up again. I realized how unsafe it was for me to be dozing off in the bathtub, so I used what little strength I had after just having woken up and heaved myself up. I was still extremely tired, but I dried off and went to my room and fell right asleep again. I woke up later that evening in a panic. I had missed some evening plans because of my unexpected nap. The whole house was dark and I was still alone. 
I laid in bed a bit longer to text my friends and say how sorry I was that I missed our plans. I heard heavy footsteps coming up my loud and creaky stairs. I had hoped my dad had come home from work, but I kept looking out my door to see him walk past my door to his, but he never did. Now, you have to understand that you didn't just not hear someone when they came up the stairs. These stairs were loud as hell, and no, it wasn't any pets. Trust me, you can tell the difference. And now, a couple of weeks ago, whatever lives in this house scratched me. I was sitting home alone, waiting on my boyfriend, who also has a gift for noticing these kinds of things, to come over. I'm one of those teenagers who can sit on her phone for hours, so I hadn't got up in a while. But then my brother's puppy, who lives inside the house, woke up and started losing his mind. He got up on the back of the couch and looked out the window and kept barking. Then the older outside dog started going nuts too. I got up to look out the door because I thought my boyfriend was early, but I didn't see any cars. The dogs weren't barking at each other, but I had no idea what it could have been. As I'm looking out the door, the back of my legs start to burn, but not enough to truly concern me for whatever reason. So I go and sit back down and the dogs start to chill. While I'm sitting, my leg starts to burn even more. So I look at it and I saw three perfect scratch marks on the back of my calf. My heart sank. I took a couple of pictures and started sending them to friends who knew about my situation so I wouldn't feel crazy. Later, when my boyfriend showed up, I showed him my leg and he agreed it was weird. When he went to the bathroom later that night, he came back out and said, Remember when you were telling me about the trap door covered by the floor in the bathroom? I said that yes, I did, and he asked if it was right next to the bathtub. I asked how he knew that, and he said he saw a blue-colored ribbon of smoke coming up from the floor in that spot. I couldn't believe it. Finally, someone else knew something was here. And now we had a house fire. It happened when I wasn't home. I got a call from my dad around four in the morning to my dad saying the house was on fire. No one got hurt and most of the house was okay, but my room got destroyed. The fireman said it was due to faulty wiring and my whole wall was ripped down to avoid it causing another fire. I was beyond pissed. I was telling a friend of mine about it and he said he could see a man in one of my pictures of the room. This friend is an empath and said the man he saw hates me. Now, I'd never said anything about my situation to this particular friend. We once worked together but didn't see each other much outside of work, so what he said freaked me out. Since the fire, I haven't really been living in that house. I've been staying with my boyfriend. I still go back to the house every now and then to see my pets, and every time I'm there, I feel threatened. It's hard to explain, but it just feels like I'm not welcome or wanted by the house, if that makes sense. I just don't know what to do about this situation anymore. I'm afraid it's never going to stop. I just wish someone could help me. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
In 2015, my husband started to get ill with heart issues. We ended up spending most of the year going in and out of the hospital. In 2016, sadly, he died. I went to pieces after losing David and felt as though my life was over. A few weeks after my husband's funeral, I started receiving text messages. Most of them were jumbled letters and numbers. The seventh text message said, Love, and the ninth said, Feel better. I've tried to trace the number, but the company says the phone number does not exist. Several so-called experts have tried to trace the number with no luck. I believe my loving husband has been getting in touch with me to tell me to move on. I saw a medium several months after his death and she confirmed that David was trying to get in touch with me. Apparently, he felt that if I didn't move on, I would be in danger of passing over too early. I like to think that he's looking over me as I begin my new life with my new husband, a man I met attending sessions with my medium. I believe David set this up for me. Has anyone else had experiences with husbands or wives trying to help their loved ones begin a new life with someone new? This is a true account of an incident that occurred early in my military career that I thought someone might enjoy. It was the summer of 2000 and I was just a non-rate stationed on a Coast Guard cutter out of Key West. We'd enjoyed three days of calm weather and the seas were glassy smooth. Rare nights like this are when smugglers like to make a run and we were sitting as a darkened ship on a known drug route, an awesome fishing spot due to the massive drop-off underneath us. We had our radars set to max, our ears wide open and our mouths clamped shut. Sound carries like crazy out there and sometimes you can hear the engines of a go-fast screaming before radar even picks them up. But the night was dead, no activity at all. I was coming on to bridge watch and our JOD was checking the equipment for a pass-down but when he got to the radar, he gave a little what TF under his breath. The oncoming OOD came over to see what was up, said the same thing, then called our CO on a sound-powered phone. We heard him say, Hey, Cap, we have two contacts moving fast, coming straight at us about 40 knots out. So we think we're about to see some action, and everyone starts getting amped up when we hear him give the speed. 400 knots and holding steady! At this point, we think it's just a radar anomaly or some running rabbits radar-type echo. But these two staggered contacts stayed on the scope, and their signal just got stronger. Whatever it was was about the size of a cargo ship moving about 450 miles per hour, and it wasn't even leaving a wake. You can see a wake on radar, especially on a calm night. After seeing this, the CO is on deck in his bathrobe about 30 seconds later, just staring at the radar, and everyone is perplexed, trying to get a look in over his shoulder. So he sends us all out onto the bridge wing with the night vision goggles and has us all looking out for these things. Every few seconds he's counting down the range, and right when they get to eight miles out, they simply drop off the radar. Boom! Just gone! Now, both of us non-rates get sent down to the bow of the ship and we're told to listen for anything, see if we could hear anything or see anything or whatever. So we listen, and it's so quiet that all we can hear is the blood pounding in our ears. Then, after not even a minute of vigilance, we see something. Two lights underwater, moving fast, coming directly at us. If we had blinked, we would have missed them. In just a moment, they had passed directly under our bow and were gone. The best description I can give would be like two train lights moving slightly staggered, not too deep under crystal clear water, maybe 40 or 50 feet down. The leading vessel was slightly silhouetted by the trailing vessel, 
and the brief impression I got of it was like the engine car of a train, just way larger. It was over so fast, I really never got a look, so I can't say much more than that about them. My fellow lookout and I exchanged a shocked look at each other, and he asked me if I had just seen it too. We talked excitedly about it for a second and ran back up to report our findings. After we made it to the bridge and started telling the CO what we had seen, the quartermaster shut us up, saying that they'd just popped back up on the radar. Sure enough, eight miles out, there they were, still moving a staggering 400 knots. We watched them disappear off radar at about 40-plus miles in silence. All of us just holding our positions until they passed out of range. Then the old man asked us what we saw. We told him, and after a minute of silence, he just said, Weird. Radar glitch it is. Then sighed and went back to bed. After he wished us a good watch and went back below deck, the COB, the most senior chief of the boat, pulled us up to the flying bridge for a talk. He basically told us there are lots of weird things out here and that it's not the first time he had heard about underwater oddities from sailors, but it was the first that he'd ever been a part of it. He didn't say we shouldn't tell anyone, but he made it pretty clear most people wouldn't believe us if we did. That was it. The next night was just as calm as we ended up stopping a drug smuggler with nearly a ton of product on board, and all we just sort of put the incident behind us and moved on with our normal lives. All I can say after two decades of experience in the military is that in the middle of the ocean, on a clear night and with a good set of NVGs, you can see little zippy things in the sky just about every night if you have some patience. In my years of sea time, I've seen lots of odd things, but that night will always stand out in my memories. I was with a group of friends, and we were together in the backyard of one of their houses. At about 8.30 in the evening, I saw a figure of a man's shadow wearing a hat, cast up on the house in front of me, moving towards one of the friends that was there. I looked behind me to see who was casting the shadow, and there was nobody there. It was just darkness. I asked if anyone else saw that, and there was only one person that didn't. It makes sense that the rest of us were pretty freaked out, so we all moved to the driveway. Then the friend who didn't see it made her way around the house. She reported that she didn't see or hear anything out of the ordinary. All the other people did not want to go back around the back. So afterwards, there were no other experiences of anything paranormal. I know what I saw was real, and there were two other people who saw it with me. One thing worth noting, though, one of the friends who was there claims she is a medium. She told me that she can sense when there is a spirit in the area. After the incident, she says that there was an energy in the area, and when we saw the shadow, it was moving towards her. My experiences started when I was very young. I remember being a child and having to share a room with this little girl named Melissa. My mother was a nurse and she always took care of sickly foster children. Melissa was one of these children who had a rare birth defect. I knew the truth of what caused her illness because she brought it with her when she was born. It came late one night as I lay in my bed close to sleep. My new little sister slept in her crib near the middle of the room. Melissa had rustled for a while before falling asleep, but the room was now quiet and the absence of sound was noticeable. I look over towards my bedroom window and see something strange. A chill of terror ran through my body. A shadowed silhouette, so dark as if it was created out of the darkness itself, showed against the light from outside. I held my breath 
as I watched the shadow of a tall Nosferatu-like creature move closer to Melissa's crib. I knew it was not a man in the way it moved. Slowly, the tall creature moved without making a sound. The sound was so absent it rang in my ears. The darkness ever so slowly leaned over Melissa's crib. Long fingernails emerged from a sleeve moving towards her sleeping body. There was something instinctively telling me that this darkness was not from this world. I knew that it did not care that I had seen it, that perhaps it had been seen many times before and knew that a child's mind would forget it as they aged. I could never forget this. Its nails dug deeper into the crib and Melissa began to scream. I covered my head with the sheets, terrified it would kill me. I felt helplessly frozen in fear. A few moments later, Melissa's screams stopped and she just cried. I carefully lifted the sheet from my head and saw that the darkness was gone, only an empty room with her and I. I jumped out of bed and ran to my sister's crib, hushing her, tears streaming down her face. I leaned over the crib and touched her tummy softly and told her it was okay, that the thing was gone. I slushed her and rubbed the tears from her eyes. I rubbed her tummy gently for a few minutes until she fell back to sleep. I looked around my room and it was just me and her. I lay on my back, staring towards the window. I wiped my tears from my cheek. I tried sleep, hoping that thing I saw would never come again. Days and weeks passed and shortly after, Melissa left our home. The memory of Melissa and that night had begun to fade until Melissa's darkness followed me. At the age of 17, I moved out of my parents and into my own place. It was the beginning of October and I was really excited to decorate my place for Halloween. I locked the door and shut off my lights, except for my one pumpkin light that sat on my dresser. I crawled into bed and, shortly after, I began to hear a familiar ringing noise as if the absence of silence was so loud. I open my eye and I see a tall Nosferatu-like creature moving closer to me. The light from the pumpkin glowed from behind it. I felt cold chills go through my entire body and I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. For a moment, I really thought somebody had broken into my house and was going to kill me. Then the memory flooded in. Melissa's darkness had come back for me. I closed my eyes and waited for whatever it was to come. I prayed that God and His angels would protect me, yet nothing came for me. The pounding in my chest filled my soul. Although scared to see it, again I opened my eyes. The darkness was gone, but the memory of the creature with the long fingers flooded into my head. I jumped out of bed and ran to the light. I checked the door, but it was still closed and locked and everything looked secure. It wasn't, though. I wasn't secure. I was horrified. I laid my back to the door and sat on the floor and cried. I thought of Melissa and how I missed her. I thought of how precious she was to me and how I didn't protect her and how weak I was that I froze again. I thought of calling my parents and telling them, but how could I tell them? I felt like a coward and promised I would never let that thing hurt anyone again. I did not sleep that night. I sat alone, waiting for the sweet sun to kiss my face. Days and months went by, and nothing happened. I waited with a bat by my bed for that thing to come back. I told myself I would not freeze again. I'd kill it. A few months later, While out to brunch with my mother, we were talking about when I was little and it was the perfect time to ask. What happened to Melissa? My mother was taken back by my question but answered, Well, I'm surprised you remember her. She didn't live with us for very long and you were very young. I know, I said, but what happened after she left us? I eagerly wanted to know. Melissa had been adopted by a wonderful family, but unfortunately, her genetic disorder had taken its toll. A few months ago, she passed away. Chills went down my spine. I knew the darkness had taken her, and I didn't stop it. When? I choked as I asked my mother. 
I think it was the beginning of October, she said. Melissa's darkness follows me now. Because of that, I have dedicated my life to hunting the paranormal. In 2002, I was walking with my parents at a street fair in Carlsbad, California, and saw a bohemian-looking man with a dreamcatcher and scoffed, stupid hippie with a bogus dreamcatcher. I thought it only to myself. My parents asked me a question, and when I heard the sound of my voice reply, I was frightened. It suddenly sounded as if I had Down syndrome. My apologies if this offends you, but I thought to myself, what if my voice remains like this for the rest of my life? I was paralyzed with fear. A few people nearby laughed at the sound of my voice and observed what was happening to me. I was mortified. I ran away from the dreamcatcher and completely out of the village fair until my voice returned to normal. On my way out of the fair, I noticed a male friend from college who I had adored and missed dearly. Fearing the curse of the dreamcatcher, I kept on running off and missed the opportunity to reunite with my college crush. I never had another opportunity to chat with him again, and I blame the magic dream catcher for the door that closed there and a few circumstances of my life lasting up to this day. I ended up having three children on the autism spectrum, which may have been a premonition or the doing of that magic dream catcher and its mysterious owner. I do consider my children blessings, but I wonder if their struggles could have been prevented. I also developed schizoaffective disorder in my twenties, and on stressful days I hear tormenting voices cursing me. Despite taking my medication regularly, every now and then I hear voices screaming at me and wishing me ill. Was it the man with that dream catcher, or merely circumstances of my life? I may never know. I'm not sure where to begin on this, but I'm writing tonight because I came across a story while reading about shadow people. I now know what I saw one night back in 2010, but my story is strange. I read about where the black-eyed kids wanted in, but my encounter, he was already in. Now, let me backtrack a little since I was a kid, I've seen ghosts and heard noises. That being said, I'm not and never have been a believer in ghosts, even though my friends and I have seen things. I tend to believe it's a mind trick or maybe something else. I grew up with and still have what is called sleep paralysis. I've seen many things during those moments. A gorilla clawing at my window growling while coming in to stand next to me, to what appears to be a two-foot-tall demon, what I found out has something to do with seizures which I suffer from. That house had a basement that, as a kid, I refused to go into. I was six when I went down there and, after that day, never again. I went down to get a toy my mom had put down there because I'd not listened to her so she put it in the one place she knew I wouldn't go, but I did, and as I got to the bottom, there was a group of people dressed in cloaks or gowns and they all turned. They were standing in a circle in the middle of the basement. Two days later, that house burned down. When I was 12, I was deathly sick. I woke up to be surrounded by the brightest light possible. I realized I was floating and had levitated to the ceiling and was right up against my ceiling light. I could hear a noise outside. I looked and saw a tall man with a black, long coat and a hat walking up my walkway outside my room, and he began to knock at my front door. I yelled for my parents, and I got out of bed, wanting to let him in, but something struck me 
and made me afraid, and I quickly changed my mind. As my mother went to unlock the door, I screamed out, don't open the door, please! They told me there was no one. I was just seeing things because I was running a high fever. The tall man didn't look like a shadow person, but it made me think of the first time I played with a Ouija board with my aunt and uncle earlier that year. I played it, but I never believed any of it. But when I went to bed that night, I woke to the shadow man standing above me and anyone who has ever been really scared knows that it's almost like an elephant is sitting on you that keeps you from screaming. As the years went on, I became obsessed with the supernatural, trying to debunk it and trying to understand why I was seeing the things I was seeing. When I was 17, I saw that bright light again. I woke to find a person standing next to me, solid white and bright like a light was illuminating her body from the inside. She came to me and got on top of me to what I would call rape me. Then things got weird when I turned 30. My girlfriend and friends would go on ghost hunts, cemeteries to old houses to abandoned mental hospitals, and that's when things took another turn. We all went in an abandoned mental hospital and took pictures and recorded EVPs. I even found a ring that I brought back as we were all done that night. We all bet back at my place and looked at pictures, and in one pic, there was something standing in a corner but appeared to be people looking out of their rooms. That picture scared everyone in the room except me. I didn't want to believe. As time went on, what sounded like running started in the room upstairs, a room that was for the kids. Then one night, I get up out of bed and my dog is walking beside me. We come out of the bedroom to go to the kitchen and the dog stops and runs away. I look and on the stairs is a kid wearing clothes that look like something from a long time ago. A black dress coat with black shorts, white shirt, but his eyes had nothing but black and above him, at the top of the stairs, an old man standing. I run, I get my girlfriend, she comes to look and they are gone. That's the story of the black-eyed kid. I never let him in like other stories say. Through the years, I still suffered from seizures and sleep paralysis. I don't know what to make of it. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. When I was in third grade in 1994, I lived in a small border town called Douglas in Arizona, USA. My dad was in the National Guard and my mom was a stylist. We lived in a new housing development called Quail Run. If you see it now, there are a lot of houses there, but when I was a kid, we were one of maybe six that were newly built. Quail Run is as far southeast of Douglas as you can get before hitting the Mexican border. I lived in one of the houses on the outer edge of the development. The house faced east, and to the southeast of our front door was miles of desert before hitting Mexico. Plain, untouched desert. I remember there was a square hole across the street where a new house was going to be built. My older brother and I would always venture out and explore. We were questioned several times by Border Patrol, but as soon as they heard our clean English, they'd leave us alone. I only tell you this because it's important to the events that occurred. There were several of them, and not always of the same nature. I read a lot as a kid, mainly R. L. Stein and scary stories to tell in the dark. I loved, and still do, the creepy stuff. But I knew early on that I didn't believe in ghosts. I never had a ghostly experience or anything like that. 
but I have had experiences of high strangeness. For example, my brother and I shared a bedroom. We had bunk beds. He slept on the bottom, I slept on the top. One night I fell asleep and woke up on the bottom. My brother woke up under the bed. See what I mean? High strangeness. We have a lot of stray dogs in Douglas. Once I saw a stray pass behind a light pole that stood outside our house, only to never come out the other side. Maybe less than a foot thick, that light pole. That was just the small stuff. My stupid brother used to try and scare me by telling me that someone killed themselves in our house, which I knew was untrue because I remember our dad taking us to the unfinished house as it was being built. No one could have killed themselves here because we were the first occupants. But even after this, I remember being quite disturbed when my mom found a red splatter stain in the ceiling of her closet. Of course, my brother said it was left over from when somebody put a gun in their mouth. I didn't believe that, but I do remember my mother complaining that whenever she would paint over the spot, it would seep through. She could never get rid of the spot. One time, near the end of our living in that house, my mom and dad were divorcing. He left to live somewhere else for the time being. My mom, brother, and I came home to find a big webbing crack on our living room window. My mom blamed my dad for the crack. My dad denied it. But that very night, we all decided to sleep together in the living room. My mom slept on the couch, my brother on the recliner, and I fell asleep on the floor between the couch and the coffee table that we had in front of the couch. I always and still do sleep on my belly. I just can't fall asleep on my back. Anyway, I remember waking up. I can move, but I don't. I can hear something rustling in the carpet near me. You know how quiet it can get and you can hear everything? It becomes apparent that something is in the room with us. I try laying still. At this point, I'm terrified, but my fear is cranked up when I feel little tickles on my bare back, as though a dog were smelling me and lightly brushing its whiskers on me. It's doing something to my back. These soft little tickles continue and then stop. I remember my mother beside and above me breathe a heavy sigh, and this gives me the courage to get up. I do so, and in the dark, I head for the kitchen light switch, which is sort of a part of the living room. Before I reach it, I see something run across the floor in the direction of the kitchen. I can only see its shape in the darkness. It was maybe a foot tall or less. It had the shape of a leprechaun or gnome, small pointed hat or head, and thick, chubby. This made me stop, but in less than a second, it was gone. I turn the light on, and there's nothing. It had run into a dead end in our kitchen and just vanished. This encounter would mirror another that occurred a few months later. My parents officially separated. I'm having trouble at school, getting in trouble a lot. I even tried to punch the principal. My mom sent me to live with my dad and his new girlfriend for about a week. After that week, he seemed to have enough of me and my troubles at school, and he sent me back to my mom. The first night I arrived back, I saw that my brother had taken down our bunk beds. He threw out all the connector pieces and made himself a huge bed for himself, two box spring mattresses below and two regular mattresses on top. Instead of taking my bed back, I fell asleep on the floor. We used to always watch Star Trek The Next Generation right before bed, and I remember watching this before falling asleep. Now our bedroom has a window that also faces east. The light pole was right outside this window and shone an orange light into the room. We used to have vertical blinds for this window, but as of this particular evening, we didn't have them anymore. Now our bedroom was on the northeast corner of the house. In our room, my brother set up his new jumbo bed in the southeast corner of the room with his head pointing south. On the west end of the room, we had our closet, and the southwest corner was the bedroom door. I fell asleep on the floor with my feet pointing east toward the window and my head pointed west, almost in the closet. I had a pillow and a thin white sheet covering me. I was sort of on my side with the sheet completely covering my head. 
I could see the bottom half of orange light that shone in from the light pole. I could see where the bottom of the window ended with the line of the black shadow. I awake in this position. I cannot move. My head is covered by the sheet, but I can still see the shape of the bottom half of the window projected onto the sheet. So keep in mind, I cannot see directly. All I see is the bottom half of the square of light from outside. I can only move my eyes. And that's when I notice something. Three shadows, like bumps, poke up from the square of light, like if three people were peeking into the room and casting three shadows in the square of light. My veins are pounding, but I can't do anything but watch. These three bumps move. They turn to each other. I can see their little profiles, lips, nose, forehead, and their lips move as they turn to each other as though they're speaking to each other. I don't remember hearing anything, but I did get the impression that they were very short. These three bumps I first thought were heads of someone poking their heads in to get a better look but they weren't. They were their whole bodies. My grandpa on my dad's side had a little foot-tall wooden carving of the Buddha. I remember it reminded me of these little things. The most frightening part was when my brother, only feet away from these things, began to toss a little in his bed and breathe a few heavy sighs. When he did this, all three of the things turned their attention to him. Their fat little bodies and profiles all turned to their left my right and watched him as if worried he might wake up. Then they were just gone. They just disappeared. I remember being able to move again and shooting up and turning on the light and searching the room to my brother's annoyance. Never found anything, but never forgot it either. I know this is kind of long, but I might as well get it all out here. Two more significant encounters that happened around this time. I began seeing psycho dot people. A psycho dot is when you look at a bright light, then look at somewhere dark, and you see a multicolored blob or dot or residue. I saw that in the shape of people and creatures, like bugs and rats. One time, while sitting on the curb with my brother at night, I saw something scurry along the curb where the rainwater drains into the sewer. It looked like a rat or a bug. The scariest encounter was when my dad came to pick us up for Dairy Queen, and I ran into my room to get my shoes, and I opened the closet door and see a psycho dot person cowering in the corner of the closet, rocking back and forth. Scared the hell out of me. But just like all the other times, it just vanished. The final thing I want to share is certainly not the last. This happened before the leprechaun-looking thing in the kitchen event. Our bunk beds were still up. We had vertical blinds on our window, though some were missing. The event began very strangely. I told my brother the next morning that my bed sneezed. What I mean is that I was asleep when half of my mattress sprang up like my brother had kicked it, only he couldn't have because the bars were too close together to fit even your hand, let alone his feet. The half of my bed where my head was sprang up for a second, then fell back flat. But I was pushed up into a sitting position. This is how I woke up that night. I look, still half asleep at the window, and where one of the vertical blinds was missing, I saw white light. It was far off at the distance. I reached out and pushed open the blinds to the right of that and see that there are three lights stationary in the far off sky three lights equally spaced apart, side by side, horizontally. I then see from the furthest left light two red lights appear and move further left. They go for a while, traveling perfectly straight, until they make a 45-degree turn downwards. They seem to go all the way down to the ground before all the lights just faded out. Nothing flew away or blasted off, they just faded out in a split second. And I went back to sleep. Like I said, I told my brother that my bed sneezed because to me it was the best way to describe it. I told my aunt once. She said she saw something similar at her house on the edge of the desert.
I went out to smoke a cigarette at 3 a.m. in the morning last night and sensed something staring at me. So as I puffed the smoke, I turned the porch light off and looked at where it was coming from. A straight-up six-foot-plus muscular albino in white just stood there in my front lawn signaling the shush with his finger. I put my cigarette out, walked in, bolted the door, and got my weapon. Didn't sleep at all last night. Woke up around noon and reported it to the neighbors. I went to see where he was standing and there were two boot prints in the grass, pretty deep too. What on earth did I see? On a beautiful day in the year 2000, my sister, who was a nurse at a large hospital in the city, was coming home from church one Sunday. Feeling exceptionally happy, she unlocked the door to her circa 1970 home, built by our father. As the door opened, a pair of swinging doors slammed shut in the adjoining dining room, and thus began a series of strange events that would haunt the house and our family for a series of years. The first events began with turning on and off the various TVs in the house. This happened with such consistency that she began to address the ghost, all members of my large six-member family would visit and wonder at how the TV continued to act up at certain times, even after repairmen were called out. After several months, water in the bathroom started to be turned on at night. That same month, my sister and her husband were cooking in the kitchen when a spatula flew off the counter, traveling seven feet and hitting my sister in the head. Later, a paranormal group from the local university would say that the ghost was trying to get her attention, so they had to hit her on the head. As all these events continued, she called her priest to come and bless the house. This happened twice till things quieted down. After several months, her 19-year-old son was upstairs with a friend playing the drums, when both boys came running down the stairs to tell her that his phone was ringing, but what scared them is that the phone was not plugged into the wall. These events continued to manifest. For example, as her son went outside one day to wash his car, suddenly all the windows of the car rolled down on their own. Dolls in the daughter's old bedroom – she was grown and married by this time – were found in the middle of the floor along with books. My sister reached out to a paranormal group that told her the entity was drawn to the house by playing of the drums. Both her husband and son played them. It was in the attic, apparently, and it didn't like her husband. Still, the happenings continued off and on for another year. I gave my sister the name of a woman in Florida that helps in such rare cases. After prayers over the period of several months, the happenings finally began to stop. She still lives in that house, and every once in a while, the TV flips channels, and my sister says to the ceiling, stop that right now. On March 9, 1929, the perfect murder occurred in New York City. To this day, it has never been solved, despite literally dozens of theories, not about the identity of the killer, but as to how the victim was actually killed. Without question, the slaying of Isidore Fink is the ultimate unsolved murder. At 10.30 p.m. on the night of March 9th, Laundryman Isidore Fink was working late, and his neighbor, Lachlan Smith, heard the unmistakable sounds of a struggle. She rushed to Fink's door, terrified of what she might find. What she discovered were doors and windows locked from the inside, except for a small transom window about the front door. It hung open with its hinge broken. Smith called the police, who soon arrived on the scene. 
Unable to enter, though, they had to find a young boy who was small enough to fit through the transom and open the door from the inside. The key to the door was in the inside lock. Officers rushed in and found Fink's corpse on the floor. He'd been shot three times, once in the left hand and twice in the chest. Neighbors couldn't explain it. Fink was a cautious man. He lived and worked in a rough neighborhood and was fearful of being robbed. His doors and windows were always locked, and he never allowed strangers to enter his home or business. According to his landlord, Max Schwartz, Fink was a good tenant and never caused trouble. He had no enemies, and he never brought strange women home with him. Detectives were baffled as to why anyone would want to kill the unassuming man. But things got even more puzzling. There was no sign of robbery. Fink had money in his wallet, and his business cash was untouched. A search of the place found no murder weapon or spent cartridges. Other than a body lying in the middle of the floor, the room was undisturbed. Nothing was out of place, and nothing seemed to be missing. The police looked into the possibility that Fink might have been extorted for protection money by gangsters, a common practice at the time, but could find no one who saw Fink approached for money or knew about the business problems of any kind. Detectives had no motive for a murder that had been committed in what seemed an impossible manner. With no gun at the scene, suicide was ruled out. The gunshot on his hand showed powder burns, which meant that he had been shot at close range. However, no one could have fled the scene. The doors and windows were all locked from the inside, except for the transom window, which was too small for an adult to climb through. The only fingerprints at the scene belonged to Fink. The murder had no motive, and no one could have committed it. Fink's murder was, by definition, the perfect crime. The New York Police Commissioner, Edward Mulroney, stated that the murder of Isidore Fink was unsolvable. After almost 90 years, that has turned out to be true. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. The captivating idea that we might be living in a three-dimensional holographic simulation has been put forward by various scientists. We'll explore this mind-boggling idea further and examine some intriguing questions. If we suspect that we are programmed beings living inside a simulation, is there any way for us to find out if this is true? Is it possible to change the outcome of this virtual game? Who could have created this matrix, and for what reason? What are ancestor simulations? Our whole world and our universe might be a virtual reality matrix, programmed by the supercomputer of a civilization of beings more advanced than we can possibly imagine. Physicist Alain Aspect conducted a most remarkable experiment demonstrating that the web of subatomic particles that compose our physical universe, the so-called fabric of reality itself, possesses what appears to be an undeniable holographic property. According to a recent theory proposed by Robert Lanza, author of Biocentrism, How Life and Consciousness Are the Keys to Understanding True Nature of the Universe, death might not even be real. We might think that we are an advanced species but we possess limited knowledge of the world around us. 
we are moved by neurophysiological signals and subject to a variety of biological, psychological, and sociological influences over which we have limited control and little understanding. Suppose for a minute that we do live in a matrix and our reality is nothing but an illusion. What is the simulation argument? Nick Bostrom, professor in the Faculty of Philosophy at Oxford University and founding director of the Future of Humanity Institute and the program on the impacts of future technology within the Oxford Martin School, presented his so-called simulation argument some years ago, and the theory is still widely debated among many scientists. If we omit the mathematical part of the argument, it starts with the assumption that future civilizations will have enough computing power and programming skills to be able to create what I call ancestor simulations, he says. These would be detailed simulations of the simulator's predecessors, detailed enough for the simulated mind to be conscious and have the same kinds of experiences we have. Think of an ancestor simulation as a very realistic virtual reality environment, but one where the brains inhabiting the world are themselves part of the simulation. The simulation argument makes no assumption about how long it will take to develop this capacity. Some futurologists think it will happen within the next 50 years, but even if it takes 10 million years, it makes no difference to the argument, writes Bostrom in his paper Do We Live in a Computer Simulation? Bostrom says the conclusion is that at least one of the following three propositions must be true. One, almost all civilizations at our level of development become extinct before becoming technologically mature. Two, the fraction of technologically mature civilizations that are interested in creating ancestor simulations is almost zero. Or three, you are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. If we suppose that the first and second suggestions are false, then we can assume that a significant fraction of these civilizations run ancestor simulations. If we work out the numbers, we find that there would be vastly many more simulated minds than non-simulated minds. We assume that technologically mature civilizations would have access to enormous amounts of computing power, so enormous, in fact, that by devoting even a tiny fraction to ancestor simulations, they would be able to implement billions of simulations, each containing as many people as have ever existed. In other words, almost all minds like yours would be simulated. Therefore, by a very weak principle of indifference, you would have to assume that you are probably one of these simulated minds rather than one of the ones that are not simulated, Bostrom explains. Bostrom also points out that his simulation argument does not prove that we are really living inside a simulation, because we possess too little information to determine which one of the three is either true or false. We cannot hope that the first assumption is false. Proposition number two requires convergence among all advanced civilizations, such that almost none of them are interested in running ancestor simulations. If this were true, it would be an interesting constraint on the future evolution of intelligent life, Bostrom says. To many of us, option number two seems an unlikely scenario considering the vastness of the universe and the number of advanced extraterrestrial species we could encounter if we had the means to travel among the stars. Assumption number three is without doubt the most intriguing one. We could really be living in a computer simulation created by some advanced extraterrestrial civilization. What Copernicus and Darwin and Latter-day scientists have been discovering are the laws and workings of the simulated reality. These laws might or might not be identical to those operating at the most fundamental level of reality where the computer that is running our simulation exists, which of course may itself be a simulation. In a way, our place in the world would be even humbler than we thought," Bostrom explains. Why would an advanced civilization create a virtual world? If each advanced civilization created many matrices of their own history, then most people like us, who live in a technologically more primitive age, would live inside matrices rather than outside, Bostrom says. 
we could be a scientific experiment that is closely monitored by those alien beings who programmed the simulation. Even worse, we could be nothing more than a virtual game to our creators, in the same way we enjoy playing computer games. It's really impossible to tell. We have computers strong enough to simulate a basic civilization already. Soon, with enough upgrades, most home computers will be able to simulate an entire universe. If you need money to upgrade your current PC, you could get a Title Max loan. How could we know if we are really living in a matrix? If the simulators don't want us to find out, we probably never will. But if they choose to reveal themselves, they could certainly do so. If the architects of this virtual reality want us to know we are a holographic being living in a matrix, they can simply make a window pop up in our visual field with the text, you are living in a matrix, click here for more information. Another event that would let us conclude with a high degree of confidence that we are in a simulation is if we ever reach a point when we are about to switch on our own ancestor simulations. That would be very strong evidence against the first two propositions, leaving us only with the third, Bostrom says. How should we live in a matrix? If we knew the architect's motives for designing matrices, then the hypothesis that we live in one might have major practical consequences. But in fact, we know almost nothing about what these motives might be. We would run experiments, discover regularities, build models, and extrapolate from past events. In other words, we would apply the scientific method and common sense in the same way as if we knew that we were not in a matrix. To a first approximation, therefore, the answer to how you should live if you are in a matrix is that you should live the same way as if you are not in a matrix, Bostrom says. It would seem there is no way to escape the matrix. Even if you think that you really managed to escape the matrix, how will you know it was not just a simulated escape? I don't know the best way to start my story. To place you in my young state of mind, I'll let you know I grew up in a house that was haunted, but it was almost fun, not scary. The lights would go on and off, things would move, and you could hear a woman humming when you stirred food in the kitchen. I thought everyone's home was like this and that everyone had a helpful humming cooking partner. I was not a fearful child. My older brother and I were about six or seven, the perfect age when you stayed over at your grandparents and had the freedom of snacks and other things that your parents limited. My grandmother loved clowns and had many glass cabinets to house them. I loved to look at them for they were bright colored. Some were glass, plush, porcelain. I guess this was before there was a widespread fear of clowns. Moving forward, there was one figure that I was definitely scared of. It was a blue and red jester-like figure complete with boots, a hat, a porcelain face, feet, and hands. It appeared to be a happy and harmless knickknack, but every time I laid eyes on it, I would have terrible nightmares about the thing. My brother would later confess he also had dreams and we always had the same dream. After every nightmare, I would wake up with my grandma accusing me of opening the glass door of the cabinet and taking the doll out to play. You see, it was always knocked over or on the floor outside of the case, on the other side of the room, far from its wooden glass home. You best believe I did not touch that clown. Fast forward about a year. My grandparents moved and my grandma came to our pleasantly haunted home. She wanted to give me something because she said she knew how I liked it so much. She brought and gave me the red and blue clown. I was calm after a moment and figured all will be well because it was just an object. Wrong. I remember waking up from a nightmare about the clown 
and walking to my brother's room as I often did when I wanted comfort. When I got into his room, he was wide awake. We both looked at each other and we knew we had both had the dream. I vaguely remember the conversation we had, but I know we planned to get rid of the clown. Now, the scary part. All the electronics in my brother's room went off at the same time. There was your typical RC car and Hot Wheels toys going off with many noises. The worst was his Buzz Lightyear action figure repeatedly stating, to infinity and beyond. Every light-up toy went off and the room was filled with multicolor flashes. So as any young child would do, we ran for it and invaded my parents' room yelling mommy and daddy the entire way. Luckily, my mother believed us, because the paranormal was, in a way, our normal. We burned and buried the figure, and I never saw it in my dreams again. I'm now 24. I do believe that the clown had something attached to it, and when it was brought into our active home, it got to come out and play. I still like clowns, but I'll never like that clown. I may or may not still be mad that my grandma gifted it to me. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. On March 10, 1928, Los Angeles mother Christine Collins was faced with every parent's worst fear – the disappearance of her child. Her son, Walter, had vanished. What happened next is one of the most bizarre incidents in the history of L.A. law enforcement, which eventually uncovered a link to one of the most heinous crimes in history. When Walter disappeared that day, the police initially suspected that he had run away. Christine, however, feared the worst. She refused to believe that her 10-year-old son would simply run off, and she came to the terrible conclusion that he had been kidnapped. She pushed the police into searching, and they began asking questions along the Collins Street and throughout the Lincoln Heights neighborhood where they lived. Finally, a neighbor, Mrs. A. Baker, claimed that she saw Walter in an automobile begging to be released. The car had been driven by two foreign-looking people. More neighbors came forward. They said that in the days before Walter's disappearance, an Italian-looking man and woman were asking for the Collins' address. But the leads went nowhere. There was no trace of the boy or his alleged kidnappers. After searching lakes, ponds, and the northeast part of the city, the case went cold. Christine was devastated but refused to give up hope. Months passed, and she devoted herself to her work in an effort to keep worries about Walter's fate out of her head. She slept little, lost weight, but did not surrender to the idea that her boy was lost forever. Then, five months after he vanished, Christine received the news that Walter had been found alive in DeKalb, Illinois. The boy was put on a train and sent to Los Angeles. The reunion of mother and son was celebrated as a massive success for the police department, which had recently been criticized in the papers for scandals caused by bribery and mistreatment of suspects. There was one problem. As soon as the boy stepped off the train, Christine realized 
that he was not her son. Captain J.J. Jones refused to listen to what Christine was claiming. He insisted that the boy had changed because of passing time and because of the traumatic conditions under which he had been living. Christine rejected his claims. She'd know her own son, no matter the circumstances. But Jones insisted that the LAPD would not have made a mistake. Trying to avoid humiliation, Jones forced Christine to take Walter home with her for a while to see if her memory would clear and she'd realize that he was her boy. Under pressure from the police, the press, and the public, Christine agreed to take the boy home with her. Subsequently, the police began to question Walter in hopes of finding his abductor. He was asked how he had escaped and how he had ended up in Illinois. Detectives and doctors were unable to get straight answers from him. He said little to nothing but insisted that he was Walter. Christine knew he was not her son, but she agreed to care for him because he had no one else. She still worked to prove that she was right because she didn't want the police to stop looking for her son. She took him to her family dentist, where she obtained the real Walter's dental records to show the difference between her son and the boy who was living in her house. The records did not match, so she took them to Captain Jones. The dental records proved to be no help. Jones still didn't believe her, or at least he claimed that he didn't. He concluded that Christine was only trying to humiliate the LAPD and he wouldn't stand for slander, especially from a woman. He knew an easy way to shut her up, one that had been proven effective before, and had Christine committed to the psychiatric ward of the General Hospital as a Code 12 internment. This was a method used by the police to lock up people they saw as being difficult. Christine was treated inhumanely in the hospital. She was drugged and abused so that she would come to her senses and admit that the boy found in Illinois was her son. She spent 10 days locked in the mental ward. She was finally released when Walter finally confessed that his real name was Arthur Hutchins Jr. His only excuse for the ruse he saw a picture of Walter in the newspaper, saw a resemblance, and decided to seize the opportunity. He knew that if he pretended to be Walter, he'd have a one-way ticket to Los Angeles where he might meet some of his favorite stars and have a chance to make it in the movies. Even though Christine was relieved that the ruse was over, her son was still missing. She returned to work and her daily routine of working, going home, and hoping to learn Walter's fate. Meanwhile, in Wineville, California, a horrific series of events was taking place. It all began to unravel when a young woman named Jessie Clark decided to check up on her young brother, Sanford, who had moved to California two years earlier to live with their uncle, Gordon Stewart Northcutt, and his mother, Sarah Louise. Jessie had become increasingly concerned about Sanford's safety and his situation with Gordon. She decided to travel down from Canada and see what was going on at their chicken ranch. Her worst fears were soon realized. Gordon was a cruel, abusive man and he treated Sanford terribly. When she spoke up, Gordon slapped her. She tried to get Sanford to leave, but the boy was too afraid. Jessie fled the ranch, returned to Canada, and told her mother everything. Mrs. Clark immediately informed the police. When local police were told about the possible abuse, they made a visit to the isolated ranch outside of Wineville. When Gordon saw police cars approaching, he told Sanford to stall them as long as he could. The boy did as he was told. He was terrified of his uncle. Gordon and his mother fled and were not captured until they reached British Columbia. It was Sanford who put the police on their trail. The boy was traumatized by his life on the ranch and he told a blood-curdling story of the horrible things that had taken place there. Sanford confessed to being forced into committing murder by Gordon. He had made him an unwilling accomplice in kidnapping and murder. Boys were being held at the ranch, murdered with an axe and then buried. One of those boys, Sanford later confessed, had been Walter Collins. In shock and disbelief, 
the police allowed Sanford to lead them back to Wineville, where they began searching for the remains of the dead boys. They found library books and clothing belonging to missing children in the chicken coop where Gordon and Sarah Louise had kept them locked up. A note was discovered, written by two brothers named Winslow, who had gone missing only 30 miles from where Walter had been taken. The note read, Don't worry, we are fine. Sanford took the police to the graves, but the bodies were gone, only scraps of clothing and a few stray bones remained. Gordon and Sarah Louise had burned the bodies and scattered the remains in the desert after Jessie Clark had left the ranch without her mother. Some human bones and a blood-soaked mattress did turn up, but the Northcutts could only be charged with the deaths of the Winslow brothers, Nelson and Lewis, and a ranch hand named Alvin Gothea. On December 3, 1928, Gordon Northcutt confessed to the three murders but hinted that there had been at least four more. The authorities believed they killed at least 20. Sarah Louise Northcutt confessed to the murder of Walter Collins, but his remains were never found. Gordon was eventually hanged for the murders. His mother was sentenced to life in prison. As far as Christine Collins was concerned, Walter was still missing. Since his remains had not been found, she held out hope that he might still be alive. She traveled to the penitentiary to meet Northcutt and ask if his mother had truly killed her son. Even though the Northcutts had confessed to his murder, he told Christine that they had not killed Walter. Whether he was telling the truth or was merely taking advantage of her hope, we will never know. Gordon Stewart Northcutt was hanged on October 2, 1930, at San Quentin. He took whatever he knew to the grave with him. The murders became known as the Wineville Chicken Coop murders, and the slayings and the vanishing of Walter Collins inspired the Clint Eastwood-directed film Changeling, starring Angelina Jolie as Christine Collins. It is a highly recommended film. Christine Collins sued the LAPD and won a $10,800 lawsuit against Captain Jones for sending her to the psychiatric ward and for his insistence that Hutchins' boy was Walter. He never paid her, and he was only given a four-month suspension for what he had done. As for Christine, she clung to the words that Gordon Northcutt had said to her from his prison cell, and she never gave up hope that her son might be returned to her alive. She died in 1964, still refusing to believe that her son was dead. Sadly, Walter Collins never returned. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. of my school friends found an ancient burial mound on the side of a hill near Phoenix that contained a silver-studded saddle and a skull. I was very wary about the find and warned the others that they'd better leave it alone. I just didn't feel it was right to mess around with a grave. One of my friends decided to take the skull and the saddle home with him. A couple of days later, one of my friends who had gone on the expedition got a call from the guy who took the artifacts asking him if he'd like the skull. Apparently his dad didn't want the grisly item in his house. You also have to remember that skulls were hot items back in the late 1950s for decoration and, of course, as candle holders. 
My friend accepted the skull, collected it, and after school, he put it on top of the refrigerator in the kitchen and went to work at his part-time job. Later that night, his father came home from work, and as he was getting ready to unlock the kitchen door, he heard a deep male voice talking from inside the house. He knew his son was at work, so he cautiously unlocked the door. When he stepped into the kitchen, he still heard the voice and noticed the skull on top of the fridge. According to my friend's father, the skull was lit up with an inner glow and it was talking, although apparently he couldn't tell what it was saying. The next morning, my friend's father made us take it back to the desert and place it back in the mound it was stolen from. When the Doughtons moved in to the rental house, it was with some relief. They'd been looking for some time, and this house was the perfect combination of size and location. They had finally managed to find the house with just two weeks remaining on their existing lease as well. In fact, the house was so nice and so cost-effective, they could hardly believe their luck. The house was semi-furnished which meant that it wasn't going to look too empty with their sticks of furniture. All of their proper furniture was still in storage in England, where it would remain until their return in a couple of years. Having some extra furniture then was a bonus. In the spare bedroom, one such piece of furniture was a large wooden closet. Mrs. Dalton thought it would make the perfect spare storage for her additional clothing, and so she intended to use it. As she started to move some of her less well-used clothing into it, she discovered an old pair of black men's leather shoes in it. Her initial reaction was to throw them in the trash, but then she reconsidered. They weren't their property, and perhaps she should put them in a plastic bag until she could check with the owners. The plastic bag was then removed to the downstairs and placed in a cupboard by the front door. That night was their first night in their new home for the next two years. They were thrilled and happy and celebrated with a takeaway and a bottle of wine by candlelight in the dining room. However, it wasn't long before they were interrupted by the sounds of footsteps upstairs. They looked at each other quizzically before Mr. Doughton went off to investigate. He came back shortly having seen nor heard anyone. As they retired to bed and switched out the lights, they both jumped as a huge crash sound came from the spare bedroom. Again, Mr. Doughton got up to investigate, and this time he came back looking pale. "'All the clothes you placed in the closet are a right mess,' he said. "'It's as if someone rifled through them looking for something.'" Both were now beginning to feel scared. They held on to each other in the semi-darkness after the light was switched off. Another bang and crash followed by definite footsteps, and on came the light. Their hearts beating and icy sweat running down their backs, they investigated the spare room together. There, they found the closet door open and the clothing scattered around the room. They looked at each other in horror. What had only moments ago been their dream temporary home was rapidly turning into their worst nightmare. It continued like this all night. Footsteps, bangs and crashes, occasional moans. Every time they went to investigate, no one or nothing was there. They spent most of the night huddled together downstairs until they could leave for a coffee shop. Anything to get out of the house. At the coffee shop, Mr. Doughton called the landlord. After several attempts, he got through. He explained that it would be impossible for them to stay in the house under such circumstances. The landlord listened patiently. "'Can I ask a question?' said the landlord. "'Of course,' said Mr. Doughton. "'When you used that closet in the spare room, did you find an old pair of leather shoes at all?' 
Why, yes, we did, said Mr. Doughton, somewhat puzzled. And you removed them, I suppose? Yes, we did. Put them back and all will be fine. Old Mr. Heldenberg doesn't like losing his shoes. We found he goes looking for them if he can't find them, and he makes quite a noise, as you've discovered. After a short discussion, the Doughtons decided to give the suggestion a try. It was such a cost-effective and convenient home, why wouldn't they? The shoes were returned to the closet. The Doughtons enjoyed a two-year peaceful rental, but they also left a note in the closet about the shoes for the next tenants. This happened to me when I was young, around five years of age. I still have no explanation as to what really happened. One afternoon, I lay on my parents' bed and fell into an unusually deep sleep. All I can remember is a partial dream where I was playing with one of my favorite toys. The strange thing was that there was another child in the dream with me. He wanted to play with my toy and grabbed it. I wouldn't let it go and kept holding on for dear life. I woke up in a daze and thought nothing of it. Years later, I married a man and we had a child. He had a shoebox full of photos and one day we were going through them together. I noticed something very strange. As a young boy, he looked just like the kid in my dream. I told him the story and we both thought it was strange, but we didn't think on it anymore. A few years later, our marriage started to break up and we were going through a really nasty divorce. After one court case, I had my daughter in my arms and he came over and tried to take her away. He was grabbing at her and I was holding her close. I realized some time after that, it was just like my dream. I had seen the future when I was five years old. About 30 years ago, a friend of a friend's sister was getting married, and I somehow found myself invited to the stag. I'd never been to the house before, and as we waited for the groom to arrive, the bride's mother insisted we have a cup of tea. We sat chatting about nothing in particular when, out of the corner of my eye, I became aware of a young boy, perhaps seven or eight, dressed in a sailor suit, go into the kitchen and thought nothing of it. As we sat, the boy came out of the kitchen and stood very politely beside my chair. I turned and said, Hello, what is your name? He very politely introduced himself as James, then chatted away for a couple of minutes about school, games, and the cat before announcing that he was going upstairs. Half an hour later, as we were leaving, I shouted up the stairs, Bye-bye, James! Our host looked startled and asked who James was. Turned out there were no children in the house, let alone one wearing a sailor suit. I never went back. I had a huge party to celebrate my 18th birthday, and the morning after, the house was trashed. I got up early to clean up, and after I'd finished cleaning, I ran to the shops. I came home and to my horror found the house completely trashed again. Angrily, I ran to get the phone as I thought my friends had come back and pulled the house apart again. Passing a mirror, I noticed a face a grinning, demonic face grinning at me. 
I turned, ran out of the house, and stayed at a friend's house until my parents came home the next day. My friend woke me up the following morning and gave me the phone. My parents were home and found the TV smashed to pieces, their books ripped up, and all the pictures looked burnt. Apparently, there were long, deep scratch marks on the walls of my bedroom, and the dog wouldn't come out of the basement. I still have no explanation for what happened, but I never had another party. I had one strange experience once that I would like to share with you. I don't particularly believe in paranormal stuff, but this was a strange story. My parents were gone out to a wedding, my sister out with her boyfriend. Having the house to myself, I decided I would shower now, then watch some TV in my room. My room is on the highest floor of my house, and to get to my bathroom, I had to walk down the stairs to my room, open my door, and turn left, and then there would be my bathroom door. At the time, my bathroom door had been left open. I got my clothes from my room, and I walked downstairs, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw something just outside the window on the far wall of the bathroom. I thought it was a dove at first, but as I turned my head to look directly at it, I saw that it was blurry and then I noticed that it wasn't a bird at all. It looked like a face, with two barely recognizable eye holes, a faded black hole where the mouth would be, and what looked to be a depression for a nose. As I stared at this, it didn't move, but it did seem to be fading away. I was pretty freaked out by this time, so after what seemed to be a minute of just staring at it, Trying to find a reasonable explanation for what it was, I reached my hand into the bathroom and flicked the light switch off. I could see it, but it was not as noticeable because of the light glare on the bathroom window. I was so freaked out by this strange occurrence, and I didn't want to go near it. I backed up into my room, turned on the bedroom light, and sat in my bed trying to make sense of it. I didn't go back downstairs again until my parents returned home the next day. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Disappearance of Walter Collins, the real-life story of Changeling, was written by Troy Taylor. Do We Live in a Computer Simulation Created by an Advanced Alien Civilization was posted at MessageToEagle.com. Fear of a Clown was submitted by Weirdo Family Member Camille. The Locked Room Murder, the Unsolved Case of Isidore Fink, was written by Troy Taylor. The Cursed Skull was submitted anonymously. These Shoes Were Made for Walking was written by G. Michael Vasey from the book My Haunted Life 3. Divorce Precognition was also submitted anonymously. Boy in the Sailor Suit was written by Alan. A Demon of a Party was submitted by Kate. And the author of Window Watcher is unknown. The following stories from this episode are all from the MyHauntedLife2.com website. My Husband Wanted Me to Find Love Again from the Other Side was submitted by Dot Linod. Underwater UFOs was submitted by Randy Malone. The Haunting Experience of Cedar Hill, Texas was written by Roger Blumenthal. Melissa's Darkness Follows Me was submitted by Judy Raderchak. The Curse of the Magic Dreamcatcher was written by Danielle. I Wish It Would Stop was submitted by Danny. Struggles with Sleep Paralysis was written by Michael. Arizona Night Creatures was submitted by Jay Santana Barrios. And The 3 A.M. Albino in My Yard was written by Liam. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. 
And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 37 verses 8 and 9. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And a final thought from Peter T. McIntyre. Confidence comes not from always being right, but from not fearing to be wrong. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses, and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks, and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com.